So if there is one, then it is, um, uh, it must be made by noon. And the juror size and alternates, the standard panel for a six person jury is 24 jurors, standard panel for a 12 person jury, 48. And two jurors may, up to two jurors, uh, alternate jurors may be requested. This is that assigned letter that I mentioned that you wanna be on the lookout. Um, you wanna be on the lookout for this because uh, actually this is the one that goes to the jury and it shows that it's been assigned to my court. The letter to, uh, to you all looks a little bit different, but it does also have that meeting ID. It tells you which court you're gonna be assigned to. And it provides um, you the email address for Jamie Foley, the court's, uh, the court's court reporter and Madeline Schlesinger, the staff attorney or whomever it is on the court staff that you should use for contact information. But that's what the juror letter looks like. It's similar to what you guys are gonna receive. Uh, in addition to that, our court also provides uh, to the jurors, Travis County Civil District jury instructions. These just answer a whole lot of questions that jurors have for us. And we can skip through that because you'll have it in your materials. I'm not going to go into that in detail given time limits, but these are the things that we want you guys uh, in your offices to be ready for. Make sure that your attorney has a professional looking background. Um, you are not likely to be on screen during the trial, but your attorney is and you want him or her to look really professional. And so take a look, practice and see what, what they look like. What does their background look like? Are they going to, does the background distract from their presentation? If so, you can use a blur feature, um, get them into a space that they're going to look professional. You don't want, you know, clutter, clutter, clutter behind them. You don't want um, a door behind them where people are coming and going. We want them to be in as professional a setting as possible so that we can focus on the evidence. Remind them to slow down for our court reporter uh, and stop talking if any essential person like a party or a juror goes dark um, or leaves the virtual courtroom. Um, remind them to talk directly into the camera so that they're not using another device and turned. If, you're if the attorney is turned this way then you know it looks like you're not they're not talking with the court with the jurors so make sure that the webcam is directly in front of them try if you can to get a widescreen monitor for the, the the people who are participating in voir dire you want them to have a wide screen so that they can see all the jurors zoom now has up to 49 tiles and so you want to see all 49 tiles on your screen and if you use a small device, you can't see all of the tiles. Um, make sure that the whoever is going to be offering exhibits or using exhibits during for dire and throughout the trial, that those pre-marked exhibits are in a place that's easily accessible for them to offer them into evidence or to use them once they've been admitted into evidence. And practice using the witness viewing file on Box before witness testimony. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that in just a little bit. Next one. Make sure that everybody who's participating in the trial is very familiar with these rules. These are on our website, the Travis County Civil Courts website. Um, become very familiar with all the deadlines set forth in these procedures and the protocols, expectations, and those are in the, the PDF for you, but um, just make sure that you are, everybody in, in, your, in your court who's gonna be participating, make sure that the lawyer, uh, your lawyer is very familiar. It also provides a sample of or dire schedule for you at the end. For the attorneys and witness testimony, um, remember, and this probably falls to a lot of you, forward the Zoom login information to your witnesses well in advance of their testimony so that you're not doing that at the last minute. Remind your attorneys to meet with the witnesses, or it could be you all doing that before trial. Make sure that they can be seen and heard before they log into Zoom. That's a great thing for you all to practice with those witnesses. Make sure, you know, just test, 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 see if they can be seen and heard. Make sure they can see you and hear you. Um, make sure that their devices are oriented horizontally and that they're centered in the tile. 
Um, what we don't want to see is, you know, this or, you know, um, this or something where they're not uh, right in the middle of the towel. You want, you want your witness to be the center of attention. If witnesses are going to be accessing documents outside the presence of the jury, then they should be trained um, on, the attorneys need to be trained on how to use the box folder. And Ms. Foley is gonna go through that process with you all so that you can practice with your witnesses in advance. All right, Ms. Foley, are you ready to get a little presentation on uploading trial exhibits? Sure. Um, so my name is Jamie Foley. I'm, I'm Judge Crump's court reporter. And so uh, when we've been using Box for a year now, and it's actually a really great way to uh, for litigants and attorneys to get the exhibits to the court reporter. And that is what it's really that's what it's intended for. And that's really all we use it for. We There are a couple exceptions, like uh, I think the juror questionnaires get uploaded there just because they're private. Um, and it's a very safe place to keep the exhibits. So um, when we, we like a week, two, I, I will probably send them two weeks before um, the trial starts. I will send a link to the attorneys and paralegals, anyone who requests to be sent a box link. And it'll contain a folder um, that has um, subfolders within it. So there'll be petitioners exhibits, defendants exhibits, and then there'll be um, admitted exhibit folder, there'll be a place for the jury charge, um, but really the attorneys only need to be uploading exhibits into their, their designated pre-marked folders. So when you do receive that link from the court, um, it'll just say, you know, Jamie Foley or whatever court reporter has uh, invited you to collaborate on Box. So you'll go to that link and it'll ask you a question which stumps a lot of people. Um, it, it just simply says, are you a part of Travis County? And you will answer no to this question because that's basically just saying you have a traviscounty.txt address, which you don't. So you're just gonna say no. And then it'll it'll send you um, a confirmation to your email that you're registering with. Oh, we have a hummus plate, Erica. Sorry, <laughs> I don't know what that is. Um, so you'll uh, just you'll have to go to your personal email address that you're signing up your account with. And it's not a paid account. You just go in and you verify that this is you who is trying to sign up for this account. And then you, from there on, whoever, whatever court reporter wants to collaborate with you, um, it will appear in your box account. So once you've done those things, you're good to go. You don't have to reset up your account again. Um, you'll just get a link from the court reporter and um, and then you're good to go. So when you're uploading, you just make sure your exhibits are pre-marked, petitioner, plaintiff, intervener, whatever you are, um, with the number one, two, three, and you put it in your folder, and it'll be up to the court reporter to, to move those exhibits once they've been admitted into an admitted folder. Um, and you really should only be using the exhibits um, that you're gonna share with the jury um, in the box application just because we want to make sure the uh, the jurors are seeing the actual exhibits that you have admitted and that we all are agreeing because you know there may be a missing page here and there and you just want to make sure you're consistently using the documents that the jurors can see um so madeline can you advance to the next screen um and so this is a preview of what it will look like if you're uh, for the witness viewing folder and now this is the folder that judge was discussing earlier um, if you have an exhibit that you'd like to offer, but it needs to be authenticated before it can be admitted so the jurors can see it, you're going to upload it into this folder within that link that the court reporter has sent you for that trial. And um, this is just a way for your witnesses to be able to view the document without the whole share screen being, you know, in front of the jury. So the jurors will be able to see the exhibit and it'll, it, that way, you know, the jurors aren't seeing something they shouldn't see before it's admitted. Um, and so we, this last trial, we, uh, we, we did it kind of real time um, to where the exhibit wasn't placed into this folder until the attorney decided they wanted to impeach a witness. Um, it can be done that way or exhibits can also be placed in here before the witness takes the stand just so they're ready to go that we know that they're good. But if you're trying to do like a surprise element, then you can do it real time. You just got to make sure that whoever's uploading those documents has access to those documents and that they know what they're doing and they know how to upload this smoothly because um, you don't want to be doing that in front of the jurors. Um, okay, so I don't know if I need to read any of these other tabs. If you could go to the next slide, Madeline. Okay, and that's, I guess, six, uh, I think that that covers my um, 
my part of the presentation. If you all have any questions, please let me know. And you Thank can you, Jamie. I appreciate you giving um, that information. It's definitely something that is tricky for lawyers and staff members. And um, Jamie is always very happy to help walk people through, but, but do uh, make sure that you feel comfortable with that process before trial. So practice, practice. Um, you're going to hear that over and over because that's, that's key to, to making sure that everything is smooth and successful at trial. When you get to the first day of trial, uh, the check-in process is going to take place on Zoom beginning at, nine, at 8 a.m. The check-in process is not live streamed. Um, you all are welcome to come into the virtual courtroom, but you'll have to have your video off and you have to be muted as you're in the virtual courtroom. That way you can see the check-in of the, of the jurors, but you're not participating in it. The attorneys can have their videos on. That's not a problem. We, I call them precious real estate. The tiles in a, in a jury trial are, are, are prime and essential real estate. So we can only have people who are actively participating in the trial have their videos on. The deputy district clerk handles the check-in on behalf of that office. They let panel members in one at a time as they arrive and then they're pushed into a breakout room. The district clerk confirms the last four digits of their phone number and renames them. The district clerk uh, has the juror number uh, and then the last name of the juror so that you know who they are. And they're placed in numeric order after they have been uh, checked in. Okay, next is just a breakdown of what the breakout rooms look like so that you, you know what to expect. There's a tech center. We have a court IT team that participates in every one of our remote jury trials, and they are on the ready to address any technical issues that arise through any litigant, attorney, or juror. And we send them directly into the tech center if and when those problems arise. There's a bench conference room. That's where the private meetings with jurors take place with the attorneys. You all are welcome to go into the bench conferences with your attorney, not a problem. Four cause interviews take place in the bench conference room, as well as any discussions outside the hearing of the jury. So if there's evidentiary objections that need to be made, but you don't want the jury to hear, just uh, we want the attorney to say, judge may have a bench conference. And uh, the host of the Zoom will push you into that room. The attorney conference room, that's where attorneys confer together. Uh, plaintiff petitioner team room, defense respondent room, the chambers room, that's just where the court members meet without anyone else. Jury room is where the jurors meet without anyone else, except for our IT team or Ms. McGee, my judicial executive assistant, when she's just providing them with some guidance as needed. But for deliberations, they are entirely alone. And then we just have some extra breakout rooms. If your firm needs an extra breakout room, don't hesitate to ask. This is the voir dire schedule in, in the 250th district court. This is the schedule I really try to keep to so that everybody knows what to expect. 8 a.m. check-in, uh, the uh, administrative judge who assists the court, whether that's the presiding judge or another judge who's assisting the court, addresses non-economic excuses like you know doctor's notes or um, I have a meeting or a flight or something like that. Um, that those excuses need to be addressed by a judge. And so the judge uh, takes those up as the jurors check in. Early jurors get to take a break and uh, certainly anybody who needs it. And then they have to return back to their computers by 8.55 once they're checked in so that we're ready to start right at nine o'clock with all the admonishments by the presiding judge. I also provide some additional admonishments in Zoom trials like no eating, stay muted until you're speaking, stay in a quiet space, stay still and centered in the tile, um, and then YouTube admonishments, which are no recording or photographing of any portion of the remote trial. And then the, um, the petitioner side, our plaintiff side, gets to do for dire. Uh, as a rule of thumb, 45 minutes is about as long as you want to go uh, without really tiring out your jurors. And so I recommend no longer than 45 minutes for a voir dire. Hopefully the parties have reached an agreement for supplemental questions. And so it's pretty, should be pretty concise voir dire. Again, you all are welcome to be in the courtroom with the attorneys and as long as the video is off. We usually take a 15 minute break in the middle of voir dire, respondent defendant side uh, after that. 
And then the court will take up economic excuses and strikes for cause in the bench conference room. Everybody goes in the bench conference room, we talk about economic excuses, we bring jurors in who we need to talk to if we believe that there might be some bias in this particular case. And then we leave the attorneys to make their strikes for cause. The strikes for cause happen uh, through DocuSign. So be on the lookout um, for an email from the district clerk's office that is a DocuSign of the panel list and the attorneys are gonna use that panel list to make X's next to their three, if there's a reduced jury or six peremptory strikes per side. Um, and those will come to me once each side has made the peremptory strikes. I marry those two together and then we seat the first 12 jurors, uh, return back the DocuSign to the lawyer. So again, be on the lookout for a second email for the alternate jurors. And the attorneys are gonna get one more strike uh, for the seating of two additional jurors for uh, the alternate jurors. And we have a lunch break. If we go long, uh, during my last jury trial, the, the parties agreed to reduce to six jurors, which meant we only had a panel of 24, which meant we finished by noon. So we didn't have to take lunch break but on a larger panel with 48 jurors, just because the number of interviews for strikes for cause, uh, we, we could go as late as three o'clock. So it's important that we have a break in the middle and we do do that. Jury and paneling uh, and district clerk announcements are typically right at or after 1 p.m. And yes, the board dire schedule could change. Uh, it could vary per judge. You know, Just wanna make sure that you ask the judge, what's the schedule gonna be? Uh, this is the, the schedule that I've shared with my colleagues and, and that I've encouraged them to follow to the extent that they can. It's hard to predict how many objections to cause there are. You know, the more complicated the case, the, the more that there typically are. Um, you know, if you have a discrimination case or if you have a medical malpractice case or a child welfare case, there are typically more reasons to make strikes for cause. And so we just have more interviews. So, you know, think about the type of a case it is. If it's a simple car wreck case, there's not usually a whole lot of strikes for cause. Um, and so, you know, we try to follow the schedule the best we can. This is an example of what the DocuSign strike list looks like. It's just a little bit different because um, instead of having it in physical form, they're making strikes in electronic form. The attorney is signing it and you can see it's dated and time stamped and that is filed um, in, in the court's record. This is what the daily schedule looks like and probably you also have the answer, is this all of the court's daily schedule? Probably not, it's gonna vary a little bit, but this is a typical daily schedule for trial. We try to keep it consistent hours. In my court, I'm always telling jurors, this is the schedule. And I try really, really, really hard to stick to it because when people can predict when they're gonna have breaks, they're more likely to stay focused. But if they're like, when am I gonna get a break? When am I gonna break? Um, then I see, I can see them losing attention. Uh, so most evidentiary objections and issues are handled before 9 a.m., after 5 p.m. or during lunch breaks to avoid jurors waiting for a long time. We really only deal with those to the extent we can while the courts in recess and the attorneys and staff are invited to, and um, the jurors go to the jury room and we all go to the bench conference room. Jurors are notified throughout the course of the trial that they can talk amongst themselves, just not about the case. And before uh, the deliberations, Ms. McGee and my court, or JEA of any other court, and a member of the IT team go into the jury room. They explain how jury deliberations on Zoom work and how to ask for help and send questions. Um, there is a, a question, uh, Amber has a question about, do I ever have to tell jurors to pay attention? Because you can obviously tell that they are not, yes, I do this all the time, not all the time, but um, I have done it in every one of my trials. And it's typically just a very uh, friendly admonishment. Juror number five, I can see that you're distracted. Is Do you need to take a break? 
um, that usually fixes it immediately and they'll go, oh, oh, no, no, no. And, you know, they're going to be real focused from then on or they need to take a break. You know, sometimes it's, oh, I'm so sorry. My cat needs to come in. She's scratching at the door um, or uh, there was a delivery and I'm sorry, I, I needed to, um, to take, I, I need to take a break. Those things are the expected occurrences in a remote trial. Uh, what I, one of the admonishments that I provide them is that they are required to be in, in a quiet space, free from distractions to the extent they can. They're at home, so we are realistic that sometimes distractions will arise. We take breaks if people need to attend to those distractions. They cannot have conversations with third parties and they can't be heard by third parties. If they don't have that type of quiet space, then they're required to go to the courthouse and participate in one of our Zoom rooms at the courthouse. Uh, the question about coaching, and this is something that a lot of attorneys asked about last year. Um, the, we'll talk about that a little bit with witnesses and when witnesses on the stand, we'll go, I'll, I'll just remind me to go back to that question. Next. I uh, wanted to let you see what it looks like from the iPads. This is what the jurors see. This is a um, view from iPads gallery view. Next is, um, this is what it looks like inside the Zoom. That's different from what you'll see on YouTube. YouTube scrambles things and it doesn't look the same. But as you can see from the Zoom perspective, um, there is a, an order. This is the first jury trial that we did. So you can see that's me, the a witness on the stand, the four attorneys who participated, um, the party, and then all 14 of our jurors in numeric order. So it's very organized and easy to see. Next. Um, so exhibits on Box. Every iPad has access to Box. That's how the jurors view the exhibits during deliberations. Uh, the court reporter removes the, ex the admitted exhibits into the appropriate folder in box and grants viewer permission. So when it's time for the jurors to view the admitted exhibits, once the attorneys have said on the record, Your Honor, I've looked at the box folder of admitted exhibits and I see that it's complete and all the exhibits are there and the correct exhibits, then once that happens um, and they are ready to begin deliberations, she she provides viewer permission. That means they can't edit them, but they can take a look at them. And before deliberations, uh, court staff provides the jurors with the log information for the presiding juror box and walks them through how to access those exhibits and how to share those exhibits with their fellow jurors so that they can screen share. And after the trial has ended, the court reporter removes per permission from the admitted exhibit folder severing access to those exhibits so they can't access them later or after. That's, uh, that's the box view that we discussed, but this is what the jurors see. Oops, no, that's not, no, that's the box view. Okay, keep going. Uh, the charge of the court is uploaded to DocuSign and, and one of our court IT members goes into the breakout room and explains to the jurors how to access the admitted exhibits, how to access and sign the charge, and how to submit any written questions to the court. Each juror can access DocuSign from their personal email address after they reach the verdict. So they announce their verdict, uh, then they follow the instructions on how to sign the verdict or to view it if the verdict is unanimous, then it's just the presiding juror. And the signed version of the charge is forwarded to the court staff and then ultimately filed with the district clerk's office. Um, so uh, Amber also asked, do you ever have to tell jurors to remove things from their viewable window, like a blanket wrapped around the juror? Um, we have blankets all the time. Uh, you know, I'm not real picky about this because quite frankly, jurors bring blankets into our physical courtroom as well. People bring blankets and um, sweaters and, um, you know, knitting material, as long as they're not distracted from the evidence, I'll probably allow it. Cats on laps, blankets, sweaters, no problem. As long as I can see their eyes, I can tell that they're watching the proceedings and, and whatever it is that they're doing is not distracting them, then I'll probably allow it. 
I want to ask uh, Madeline, my court staff attorney, if she would walk through some reminders for screen sharing, because this is a place where I think you all can be really helpful to your attorneys and making sure that they have a professional presentation. Madeline? Hi, yes. Good afternoon. I'm Madeline. I'm Judge Crump's staff attorney. And um, screen sharing can be a bit of a learning curve, but um, we've had a lot of practice and so we have a few tips to share. Um, first, if there is a member of your staff, either you or a, um, another staff member that can assist the attorney during the trial with screen sharing, that can be really effective. And so the attorney can focus on their argument and their questions without having to worry about the screen share. That's worked well in the past. And there's a function um, on screen share on Zoom called advanced screen share, which is what I'm using now. And it allows you to just see a portion of the screen rather than the entire screen. So for example, I'm gonna show you what it would look like if I wasn't using advanced. You'd see you know, my entire uh, desktop. Um, so, and now I can just squish it back up. So you're just seeing, um, it looks like I messed it up a little bit, but you get the idea. Um, oh, let me chime and, in here, Madeline. So what, why this is so important is because if your attorney is not doing this properly, or if you're not helping, what we're going to see is instant messages between you and the attorney or the attorney with co-counsel or with client. And, and that means I'm seeing these things. That means the jurors are seeing these things. Um, you know, whatever you were looking at on or the whoever shares screen sharing, what they were looking at in, in the Explorer um, these are all kinds of things that you don't want the court and the jury to see. So this is so important. I, I can't, if I had a dollar for every time people would had inadvertently shown me things, um, but it's a real simple, once you know how to do it, just advanced screen share, practice, practice, practice. Thank you, Madeline, sorry to interrupt you, but just want to make sure you know why it's so important. No problem. Absolutely. It's, it's not only distracting, but it can be um, really embarrassing for the attorneys if they inadvertently show the court and the jury something that they didn't mean to. Um, and then here is photos of what it looks like on Zoom. So when you press that little green button that says screen share, um, you'll see the option to click advanced or basic. So if you toggle over advanced, you'll get this second screen, which is the second picture you're seeing here and then you click portion of screen and that way you can choose how much of your screen you're wanting to share. Um, so this is something that would be good to practice um, with your other staff members or your attorney uh, before trial and we're happy to answer any questions folks have about this too. Thank you. Um, Every once in a while, you'll have a situation where uh, you have an, a witness who is in a penitentiary. In, in state court, you know, you there are procedures for getting that witness in, but in federal court, it's a little trickier. Um, and some correctional facilities don't allow the use of Zoom or Skype. And so if that's going to be the situation, I just encourage you to talk with the court about that situation. Um, and we can potentially uh, get the witness through some third party uh, platform. And we did that with uh, the trial in December using Connexus. <clears throat> it's difficult, it's expensive, and it needs to, we need to have a request in advance for any type of situation like that. It's kind of unusual situation, but I want to let you know. I also wanted to, to remind you to let us know if you're going to have a foreign language interpreter. Um, whoever is preparing the Zoom has to know in advance so that we can use the Zoom interpreter function. Um, if, you, if there's going to be an ASL interpreter, either one of our jurors could be deaf or one of the witnesses. Either way, they're going to use, need to use the pinning function. And so um, be sure to let your attorney know that if he or she has a PowerPoint presentation, the 
ASL pinning may disrupt that PowerPoint presentation unless you know to use the advanced features that Madeline described, because there's also a way to make the PowerPoint presentation as your background. Um, we can talk through ways to assist you in doing that, but just if, if um, be aware, we are in Travis County, Austin, Texas is the home of the School for the Deaf. We have lots of deaf jurors. Um, three out of the last four juries, I think three or two or three out of the last four juries have had deaf interpreters. They're fantastic, they're wonderful. Uh, but there is the procedure does require pinning, which could disrupt a PowerPoint presentation that the attorney wants to use during voir dire or opening statement or throughout the course of trial. So just be wary, be aware and be ready for that type of situation. Uh, so now I want to make sure that I get to all your questions. Um, one question was about coaching. Um, the, the coaching issue is a, an issue that we have, whether we are in person or in a remote jury trial, um, it's always a concern. There was um, one of the admonishments I make, I think if you go to preparing a witness, can you go to that slide for me, Madeline, preparing your witness? Sure. Um, one of the things that I'll do in terms of admonishments and what I ask you all to do is to make sure to tell your witnesses that they are not to look at any documents um, or any device unless specifically asked to do so. Um, on a number of occasions, I've had to admonish a witness not to look at anything on their screen other than the Zoom. Um, you know, we expect honesty and we, um, we require honesty. Uh, but the admonishments do provide uh, an ability of the court to hold someone in contempt for failing to do so. Um, we don't have it on there, but if you would, Madeline, would you put up the, the little flyer that we created that is things to do to prepare your witness for, for a remote jury trial? Yes. I know I didn't ask that in advance. I thought it was in there, but uh, it looks like I forgot to put that in. Uh, but just some things that we want you to do when preparing your witness for trial. Um, and I'll share that with Amber so that she can get it to you because it's things that we definitely want you to, to do. Do you guys have any other questions while we're looking for that? I want to make sure that I answer any questions that you have and allow for some time for that. Uh, we I can tell when people aren't paying attention or they're being coached uh, because I can see eyes moving. It's kind of one benefit of uh, a remote trial that I don't have an in-person trial because in an in-person trial, the jury's over here. My witness is directly to my right. And so um, the, you know, there could be something happening that I miss because a witness is right next to me. First, most people are honest. I mean, that, that's, that's true. That's a fact. Uh, there is, people do act improperly in trial. They act improperly even when they're under oath. Um, and so we have ways to, to try to address those things as quickly as we can. And we do do that. We do try to address them. But in a remote trial, I can see eyes. I can tell if they're looking at their phone. I can tell when they're looking at another device. I, or, you know, I can see a lot in a remote trial that I can't see in an in-person trial. And actually, so in many ways, it's easier to tell if someone's being coached. Um, how are the courts handling not reaching trials and having to get rescheduled? Uh, the court administration uh, about midway through last year started encouraging people to have backup jury trial settings. And so if you don't get reached, on your first setting, then you have that backup date and you will have priority on the backup date. Just having jury trial settings has benefited us a great deal because it forces parties to talk about settlement and to face the reality of going to trial. And so that has actually allowed us to resolve a big number of cases. And that's, uh, that's really super, super helpful. Um, this is a, a little, document that I created just to, to help you guys remember how to prepare your witnesses for remote jury trial and Zoom. Uh, remember to forward login credentials. Um, remember to practice how to connect to audio, how to mute and unmute, how to start and stop video, how to enter and 
exit breakout rooms. Make sure that your witnesses have an electronic device with a camera, a preferably a laptop or a tablet, not a phone. Phones are just terrible on Zoom trolls. Remind them to be in a quiet space free of distractions with adequate lighting, either a ring lighting or a lamp or something behind their camera so that we can see their faces um, and then horizontally oriented and centered in the Zoom. Encourage them to uh, appear no later than 15 minutes before their anticipated testimony and that they have silenced all their devices, including on their computer. It's very distracting when someone's giving testimony and it's bing, bing, you know, their emails are coming through. Um, so not just their phones, but also their, their, their computer that they're using for their Zoom. Make sure that those are silenced, that the emails and um, alerts are silenced. Turn off YouTube when they're testifying. If they have YouTube going and they've been watching the trial, uh, either you know, a lawyer, purely anybody who's, who's going to unmute their microphone, if you have YouTube streaming, we're going to hear it. It causes feedback. So make sure that those are off. If the rule has been invoked, they you need to tell them not to uh, watch the live stream at all. And I'm going to be asking if they did. Uh, and that certainly will affect their testimony. <clears throat> if they are in violation of the rule, they may not be permitted to testify. Instruct the witness not to look at documents or devices while they're testifying unless instructed by the court to do so. Uh, we talked about the rule already. Uh, we want them to know that they don't have access to the internet or adequate device. We can get them a Zoom room. Um, and then uh, number eight is really just what we talked about already with refreshing their memory. If they're going to be looking at a document during their testimony, they need to know how to log in and access those documents on their device. So walk through all of these things with your witness before they testify. Thanks, Madeline. All right, any other questions? We have a jury trial in November, 2021. Do you believe the court will still be having remote jury trials? That's a great question. Uh, and one that I cannot uh, really answer. I don't know. It depends a lot on how things are going. It, it may depend also on whether it's a very simple trial that can be conducted by Zoom and if the parties want to have a trial by Zoom. Um, if so, I think that there will certainly be some judges who will entertain a request to have a Zoom trial. Uh, but if both sides want to be in person, or you know, we have a, a large percentage of our community is vaccinated and um, we have plexiglass in our courtroom already, but you know, if everybody can be socially distanced in the courtroom, it would you know if it's a reduced jury, so that we can get the jury in the gallery and the witness in the jury box, maybe by November. I hope so. I mean, I think everybody hopes that we'll be back in the courtroom by November. I think we hope to be back in the courtroom before then. Uh, but we are following the guidance of the Austin public health officials and, you know, just reviewing that to see if and when that's going to be um, to be safe. So that's what we'll be looking at. We have a planning meeting in a couple weeks, the district judges, and we're going to be determining what the next six months looks like and, and planning for that, planning for our return to the courthouse. Uh, we're all very eager to not be doing this, but we also want to keep everybody safe. Any other questions? No, I don't think so. But thank you very much for and bringing your staff and all of the very helpful slides and documents. Um, uh, I think that a lot of the paralegals here do are participating in trials at their firm. And so I think this will be very helpful for all of them. Um, so thank you very much. I don't see any other questions. Um, okay, it was my pleasure. Thank you for the invitation, Amber. It's great to see you all. And, yeah. and I wish all the best. Don't, don't hesitate to reach out to our court staff if you need anything. If you have questions as you're going along, we are always happy to answer questions so that you, you know, your team can be as successful as possible in these remote jury trials. Okay, so y'all take care. Bye-bye. Thank you.
So I'm going to give just a couple more um, announcements about our upcoming events. Um, our April board meeting is April 15th at noon via Zoom, and all of the membership is always invited to attend and encouraged to check it out to see um, what goes on and keeping our organization going. Um, our Kappa Spring CLE is coming up, and you should be seeing a flyer in the next day or two. Um, there was a flyer momentarily today that we took down because it did have a little bit of incorrect information, um, but it's going to be four hours of CLE. Um, Pam Horn, yes, there is going to be a certificate of attendance available for TBLS civil trial for today's um, presentation. At our spring CLE, we're going to have four speakers and we're going to have TBLS certification for civil trial, personal injury, family law, and criminal law. It's going to be $35 for members and we have a $250 grant prize that will be given away there um, by Veritex. Um, we'll also have gifts and given by other sponsors like Texas Legal and I see Debbie was here today. Hi Debbie um, and Kim Tyndall. Registration is not quite open for the spring sale. It should be open in the next day or two. Um, but just to give you a brief preview, we're going to have Kara O'Shaughnessy talking about metadata, um, Maggie Ellis talking about juvenile law, Adam Lowy talking about personal injury, and Carlos Salinas talking about I-864 affidavits and family law cases. So that's going to be a crossover of immigration and family law. So each presenter is going to have a crossover um, between two, at least two areas of law. Um, so we're really excited about that. So we'll have prizes. You could win $250. That's, if that's not enough for you to go, I don't know <laughs> what else you would want. Um, and then we will be sending out a link to um, this presentation. I'm going to admit that I forgot to hit record at the very beginning. So you're going to miss the slides of like the juror getting their packet and stuff, but hopefully <laughs> You won't get too mad at me, but you will have all of the slides. Um, I just missed the very beginning of the recording because I spaced on that. Um, so thank you everyone for attending. We won't have a monthly meeting next month, but we will have the, the all day uh, spring CLE. It's on Friday, April 30th from nine to three. You'll get four hours of CLE and lots of prizes. <laughs> um, and thank you for joining us today. And then we are done. Oh, I'm sorry. I did we have two gift cards to give away from Kappa and I put everybody's name on a random generator and Talia Traub and Brenda Colvin were the winners. So I'm going to send you both emails afterwards so that you can pick a gift card um, from Reward Genius. Um, but now we are finished and thank you everyone for attending and hopefully I'll see you at the spring CLE or the board meeting. Bye-bye.